All right, Ellen Kestenbaum joined us. Hey, Ellen, how are you? Good, how are you? How are you doing? Doing great, thank you. Doing great, thank you very much. Good. Uh, let me start with you on, you tried to buy a sports team. Uh, then you're, you became a limited partner in a team. Uh, macro level, your thoughts of sort of the rise of SPACs as it pertains to uh, an acquisition vehicle for pro sports. You know, I, I think that the... Um that in order to answer that question, you really just need to look at the success or lack of success of public companies in sports uh, teams generally. And it has not been very good. Look at, you know, look at the Braves and, you know, look at uh, MSGs and look at um, uh, the Packers. I mean, these things just don't trade well. Um, there was an article out today at, uh, on a publication talking about this as a potential stopgap for um capital calls. And I don't actually see that because at the end of the day, SPAC investors are funds, they're hedge funds, they're people that want to make money on the stock. And the notion of making stock by uh, making money on the stock by being a vehicle to keep making capital calls for money, losing businesses just doesn't seem like a very appealing thing for investors. So, um, you know, I, I you know, just from my own experience, it, you know, investing in the NFL and, and being connected with a team is a is just a phenomenal experience because, first of all, um, it's it's a good business, but it's also a lot of fun. You know, the, the fun part of it in, you know, for a public shareholder of a company doesn't exist. So I don't, you know, we, we don't really believe that um, SPACs are, are good, um, are good uh, investment vehicles. Uh, for limited partnerships in in sports or even control position in sports, unless you're going to make it something bigger. And and what I mean by that is if you can control it and if you can take the team and 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 make it as a you know like actual content and take that content and amplify the content and make all kinds of cool things uh, that might interest people and create other advertising revenues and everything else. That's a whole other thing. And basically what you're doing then is taking content and you're distributing the content and trying to make money off that. Um, but, you know, the notion of just sitting, being a passive team owner with a spec, um, you know, it just doesn't work, I think. No, but we, we've seen so perhaps utilizing the notoriety of a team to create a media company, for instance, which is what team owners are perhaps trying to do right now anyway. So that I mean that's 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 correct. I mean that's how it works. But you know, uh, and 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 teams that are in um, markets uh, who have gone you know with local cable companies, those cable companies do really well, and the ones that are in small markets uh, don't. Uh, the NFL, by uh, by contrast, uh, never went that way, and that's why they're so successful because the NFL went and uh, consolidated the media rights, sold it as a as a package for the whole league as a national contract, and that's why the NFL. You know, has won that game. So the notion that uh, a team is going to be able to do, you know, a small, let's say a large market team already is working on cable. Eventually, they'll distribute it through some other, uh, through some other um, vehicle. Uh, you know, that that's fine. But the notion that a small market team that's struggling to get a lot of money off the media is going to somehow be able to do it just because you know a SPAC's involved and they've got a, a digital platform. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily see that, but that, but that's, but I think Scott, that is the right point. In other words, if someone is able to do that, that would make a spec an appropriate owner. But that's again, you know, distribution of content as opposed to just owning a team and watch them play ball live. Right, Rob, you sure you don't want to take this out to the patio? That looks really nice out there with the snow that's out here. Uh, I can if you want to, but I <laughs> probably my Wi-Fi may run out if I go out there. Gotcha. Got. Well, right, let me ask you this. I don't know if you if you were tuning in earlier, but we were asking Colin Neville at Rain sort of about process, and there was there was a sigh, a detectable sigh of sort of the laborious nature of of the process. You're out there hunting. Is it happy hunting? What's the process like for you? How's it going? Well, uh, we have it. We're in the deal business to begin with, uh, so we we see a lot of transactions. You know, pre spac. So. Now that we have a SPAC, yeah, I think it's amplified even more just the, the amount of companies that we're seeing and talking to. Uh, and it covers a gamut, a wide range of things. As Alan said, we're not really focused on the team related business, but everything from, you know, hospitality, ticketing, live entertainment, uh, sports betting, iGaming, you know, go down the list of all these different sectors, data analytics, 
then you know it's it's been quite robust. These are these are all things you mentioned, by the way. When I talk to team executives, team presidents, CEOs, these are all things that have taken on an increased importance in COVID era with digitization, ticketing, um, tech. It sounds like all the things that there's that pent up demand that will have legs long past the COVID era, perhaps even accelerated importance in, in sports. Yeah, I mean, the way I sort of look at it is like the last 20 years, the main drivers in, in our industry have been around uh, media values, traditional linear media, then TV, satellite right. cable, yeah. and then also real estate. So there's been about $20 billion put into the ground in the United States to build out the venues. The next phase over the next 10 years is going to be around innovation, technology, fan engagement, and new businesses that are going to you know really explode to to accelerate that trend. So that's, that's, I think what we're, you know, trying to get out in front of. Brendan. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm curious because you are, you are, you both have a spec going right now, sports ventures and you, you're out there in the market. What is, what is, you know, when I talk to, to SPAC sponsors, I say, well, are you worried that there are too many SPACs out there? I mean, are you worried that there's too many people competing for the same deals? And what was sort of the deal flow that, that you're saying to the extent you can, you can say? I think there's a uh, you know there's, a, there's many deals out there. Uh, there are those that are strictly financial in, in nature. Um, I think our particular spec brings a, a really unique set of uh, uh, sponsors. Uh, one, uh, we have um, a lot of public company experience, uh, especially myself. This is my third public company, so uh, the art of running a public company, which includes you know things like when do you do share buybacks, how do you structure a transaction, presence in the market, investor following. Um, I'm amazed that uh, even though this is a sports back, how many investors on our roadshow showed up and said, "Hey, we've been investing in your other companies. We, you know, we we believe in you. We want to uh, we want to invest in, in this particular company." You know, business is about really um, is is really about people at the end of the day. And if you know if if someone has uh, a good following, um, that's important. So I think that our spec uh, has that aspect. And the other spec that brought uh, the other as aspect. I said spec, I meant aspect <laughs> that, uh, that uh, Rob mentioned. Um, you know, Rob and Steve are out, have been out in the, uh, in, in the, uh, in, in the deal making business now for a couple of decades. And um, I can tell you from my own personal experience, having worked with them, having hired them uh, on the transaction that I did before the spec, um, I you know their analytical capabilities, their relationships, uh, their, 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 you know, integrity uh, is, is second to none. And, and so as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of deals. So we're, you know, we're seeing some deals that are, um, you know, very competitive uh, from a SPAC perspective, uh, but really focusing on the ones that, were, that, that would appreciate the added dimension that we bring. So those typically require a little bit more work, a little bit more creativity, uh, and, 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 and typically require the types of um, benefits that, that we bring. And that's where we're spending most of our time. I will tell you that the pipeline is very, very robust. Um, we're seeing a, a, a lot. Um, we're quickly, uh, you know, getting rid of the ones that don't make sense for us, but focusing on the ones that do make sense. Uh, and, and um, you know, I think people like to come to us because they know, they know what we're doing. So, um, you know, I read like you do a lot of SPACs out there. Um, but uh, there's also a lot of businesses out there, and I think that uh, we've been fortunate so far to, to see the ones that are, that are good. You know what I want to ask, Alan, because given your long background in, in, in the financial markets, you know, starting at back when you start trading commodities, what do you make of, the, what do you make of these SPACs uh, that, have, that file for multiple SPACs at once? There's a, uh, not, not to criticize, or I'm not criticizing, but like William Foley, who owns the, the Vegas Golden Knights, he, he'll, he'll file for, for two, three SPACs at one time. You, you might have four outstanding right now, and there are others. Um, what do you make as someone who's running one SPAC uh, with this trend towards, towards filing for multiple SPACs at once? Um, you look, there, there are SPACs that are simply providing a bucket of cash and are a financial tool, and those sponsors have little interest in what they're buying other than to be the bridge, so to speak. If you think about it, you know, they're essentially filling the role of an investment, what an investment banker might do. Um, and, you know, obviously the fees and the dilution related to the SPACs seem to be higher, but uh, those companies that want to go public through a SPAC, um, those are probably good places. People who are indifferent to the businesses that they're, that they're involved in. 
I, you know, we've got a little bit of a different, uh, a different approach. Um, you know, we think that making money for our investors um, is, and for ourselves is about staying involved in the company, helping the company, working with the company and its management. And that obviously you can't do three or four of them at a time. You know, it, it's a, it's a, it's a very busy job to take a company and make it worth a lot of money. And so that's our approach. Uh, you know, others have much more strictly financial approach. And so if you're doing just strictly financial and you're looking at a bunch of deals and you want to park your money there and, you know, uh, there's no, you can be efficient and, and do several of them. So it depends what your goals are. Um, you know, my, our, our, our goal is to find something, help it grow into something amazing as a business that'll last for a real long time. Interesting. Interesting. Hey, Rob, look, let me ask you this. Let's, let's sort of flip it to the, to the target side. Um, uh, you know, I, I just simply writing about them, I, I get a lot of increase in, from people who would say, hey, I, I would love for a SPAC to look at my business. Um, you guys must be getting must be getting a ton of cold calls. Um, but what do you think? What do you think a SPAC does um, differently for sports related or sports business now than than sort of the other ways of how business deals used to get done, private equity or or, or that sort of thing? Well, to me, this is a whole new channel that's now that's now opened up for people that never even really thought about potentially being a public company. I think there's an ex accelerated trend now. So if you're a high growth business and you're building quickly and you're scaling and you have a good tech platform or backbone, then all of a sudden this can turbocharge your growth. You can also use it as a tool for, you know, M&A for, for scaling even faster. So it does create this whole new uh, leg of, of, of capital that we re really never had before. Prior to that, it was like, okay, you went through like your series, you know, your seed round, your A round, your B round, growth round, dilute, dilute, dilute. Now you can kind of maybe accelerate over those steps and, and, really, and really get to scale first. Well, we're, you know, I just want to kind of emphasize one thing Alan said before. What's really interesting for us as we're talking to people is, there's all this talk about SPACs, but not a lot of talk about like, well, what does it actually mean now that I'm a public company? So when we go and we're talking to targets and Alan says, you know, well, I'm, I'm doing my secondary offering or I'm on the road show right now. And here's what investors are asking. And here's what, you know, research is required. You know, those things are really important to explain to people that have never been in a, in a public environment before. So that's, that's what I found super helpful. Rob, how, how many potential targets from that perspective are prepared, truly prepared for a deal to be done? Yeah, it's a good question. Some are more ready than others, but it doesn't mean you can't, you can't get ready. So getting, you know, we heard from uh, the Grant Thor people, getting your financial statements ready, getting organized, making sure you have the right resources on board from a HR, IT, finance, legal so yeah there is some building that needs to go there so it's a, it's a little bit all over the place that you know some companies are you know just ready to go right now so it does vary a little bit yeah hey, Bro, Alan. oh sorry go no, ahead. that's okay go ahead Brendan. oh I, I i i was talking with a hedge fund uh, manager uh, a few weeks ago and uh, he was he was mulling uh uh doing a spec right he says the bank wants him to form a spec uh, but he's trying to figure out where, where it's going right do i want to is the best strategy given there's so many specs? Is it to be smaller, uh, go for a smaller IPO, bigger IPO, focus on focus on something else? I, I, I sort of we keep talking about sort of how we got here, but where where do you see things going? Yeah, that, that's uh, we we grappled with that question uh, by way of example when we went out to raise our our money. We actually had we were four to, more than four times oversubscribed. We had access to uh, over eight hundred million dollars, but we decided to keep it at the level that we're at, uh, which is uh, two thirty. And, and the driver there was um, a, a few things. First of all, uh, if, you can, if you find a deal and it needs money and you've identified the deal, it's a lot easier to, to raise money uh, with a known quantity, with a known deal uh, and, and establish a valuation. So our view was, well, you know, if we can go raise additional capital, a higher price than the $10 issuance price of the spec, that's actually gonna be less dilutive to us you know, in the long run, and also a better alignment for our shareholders. Um, selfishly, we could raise a larger one, have a bigger promote, uh, and uh, but I think in terms of building value, again, long-term value, it's about getting the share price up. And so our view was this was the right spot because it really covers deals that could be, 
you know, as small as a couple of hundred million up to a couple of billion. Uh, and then, you know, if you need more capital uh, to go along with that, you have access to um, the investors that are with you or other investors from the outside. Uh, and so you have a lot of flexibility with that side. So that's what we decided um, uh, at that particular amount. Uh, and, and, you know, I could see the case for, for, for a larger amount as well. But then it's really hard to do smaller deals that may have tremendous growth potential. When people ask me, you know, what's your what's your target size? My answer always is, it all depends on how much money I can make. Uh, I'd rather buy something for zero and make a, a hundred million than buy something for a hundred million and make a hundred million. I mean, the math is, is simple. It's, a, it's, it's based on returns. So uh, we think this is the right size. It covers a very wide range of transaction size from 200 million to 2 billion. Um, and, uh, there's, you know, we, 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 we know that, uh, with the right company, there's, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of capital available to us. And, and, uh, you know, I want to reemphasize this point, um, that Rob was saying about companies being prepared to go public, the companies that are going public by, by SPACs, you know, if they had a choice, they'd do a regular IPO because with a regular IPO, you're getting research coverage and everything else. That's not automatic in a SPAC. Um, I know from my own experience when I ran a SPAC, that my first bank rather um, getting research coverage post despanking wasn't the easiest thing. Clearing up warrants wasn't the easiest thing. Um, I think what, one of the things that we can help companies with who are unfamiliar with this uh, in a unique way is, you know, we've done this now a few times. So know exactly how it is. Um, things don't necessarily cost as much or as little as someone might think or take as long as or as short as someone might think. And so, you know, just the ability to, to, to know, to navigate that and what to do post despacking to get research coverage, to deal with the warrant overhang, things like that. Um, experience really helps in that. All right. For both of you, just because we're so focused on, on, on sports teams here, Rob, you've dealt with leagues for decades. Uh, you, you know their nature. You know the, the ownership nature. Uh, where do you see SPACs as a vehicle in terms of liquidity? Obviously, there are leagues that are looking at alternate financing techniques, opening it up to uh, private capital. Just your thoughts on whether we'll see uh, SPACs uh, as an acquisition vehicle for pro sports teams. I mean, I think what we've seen over the years is, you know, people have – taken some teams public and it didn't work, right? The Celtics, the Indians. And the reason I'm not bullish on it is because really three things. Number one is the transparency issue. I know someone said before, well, transparency isn't a big deal, blah, blah, blah. But it is a big deal because the leagues guard their information very, very carefully. And they've done that for a very long time. And I just don't see that changing. The second thing is in terms of thinking about you know, appetite for for these types of, of transactions. I mean, yeah, it's great to say I, I can, you know, be an investor in a team, but then it comes down to like, okay, well, what are my returns? And the returns have been, you know, fairly average, I would say, over a long period of time for those that are that are public. And then the third thing is, you know, let's not overlook the fact that teams do lose money on certain occasions, particularly during a pandemic. So you have things like capital calls and money that has to go into the business. You know, I don't think it's been carefully traced in terms of like, I think it's looked at like, okay, here was the acquisition price, here's the sale price, but then how much money has gone in in between? And that I don't think is really known. I don't think that's known by you guys or, or a lot of other people. We know it because we've, we've been doing this a long time. So when you look at like the total rate of return, you can't just look at like, okay, here's the compounded annual growth rate and that's going to continue because these these businesses do require capital over time. So in summary, don't think it's a, don't think we're going to see a huge rush of SPACs buying sports team, my opinion. Yeah, Alan, you're on the ownership side. Do you look at things that get the promotion from professional sports and then scale far outside the sports world, whether it's connected fitness, um, bio data, uh, just seems like you, you might as well look, look at companies that play in the sports world, however, scale far beyond that world. That's exactly right. Um, that is absolutely what we're experiencing here, Scott, right now is, um, you know, being in pro sports really opens up a lot of doors to you, uh, to the very type of ancillary businesses that you're, uh, that you're discussing. I've been introduced over just over the last six weeks of some of the most amazing things that are going on 
uh, that you'd never know as a sports fan or you'd never know as uh, you know, you'd never pay really pay attention to is some of it is on the analytics side some of it is on um, which, which of course you know analytics is not limited to sports it could apply to sports but there's so much of the world that's going on uh, outside of uh, sports that could benefit from similar artificial intelligence analytics things like that uh, and then, you know, all the other ancillary businesses uh, that I routinely have been contacted with now with the SPAC, um, it really uh, has opened my eyes to, uh, to so many different uh, things, whether it's in hospitality, whether it's in, you know, uh, 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 technical, uh, te uh, you know, digital distribution of, of the content, things that are not pro, but, uh, but are, and, are, and are amateur and, and, and that have that type of uh, following to of those sports that i've never I've, i had no exposure for so it's really a phenomenal thing and i um you know i i i'm learning i love taking the calls um you know i'm the kind of person that i've always always in my career i've always listened to someone first and then decide later or not whether it's worth worthwhile and uh you know as a as someone being in professional sports i've had you know a lot of exposure to a lot of really cool and interesting businesses. Some are going to make it, some will not, but uh, certainly learning a lot. And um, I think that's where our SPAC comes in because it's a vehicle to go and actually leverage uh, those uh, those opportunities. All right. Well, Alan and Rob, thanks so much for taking the time. We do appreciate it. I hope stick around. We've got a, uh, a recorded interview due to uh, Indomitian Sue's busy schedule post Super Bowl. Brendan sat down with him not long ago, a couple of days ago. Uh, we're talking about athlete involvement in SPACs, athletes' involvement in business off the field. He, he's one of them. He, he's a big man, with, but a soft voice. Uh, Brendan, why don't you tee up what, what he told you?